Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the press conference following the Tripartite Social Summit, the first event of this day. The President of the European Council, Herman Van Rompuy, will present the main results of the summit. President Van Rompuy, you have the floor. Thank you. Today's Tripartite Social Summit was focused on investment. The title was Stimulating Private and Public Investment to Create More Jobs. And indeed, Europe has to invest in its future. Youth unemployment erodes the basis for future growth. We risk a lost generation. Without a skilled workforce, Europe's place in the world economy of tomorrow is at risk. Despite all the efforts and signs of improvement in some of our countries, the fact is that unemployment remains unacceptably high. More than one young European in five on the labour market cannot find a job. But there are wide disparities. In some member states, more than one young job seeker in two cannot find a job, whereas in others, youth unemployment is below 10 per cent. This proves that national policies matter. Governments, both individually and together as a union, can make a difference. We are close to an unprecedented stagnating nominal GDP in the euro area. This is a collective problem, which requires action by all. Persistently low inflation in a context of high total private and public debt puts a break on growth for various reasons. It brings up real interest rates and increase the debt burden since the real value of debt goes up. It also makes it even more difficult to regain price competitiveness in the countries that would most need to. Economic growth is also held back by a lack of internal demand, a shortage of credit in some of our EU member states, and weaker growth in the large emerging economies and uncertainty linked to geopolitical risks such as Iraq, Syria, Ukraine and Russian sanctions. We must more forcefully implement the policies that address both its structural and its cyclical factors. On the structural side, there is first a strong need to shift taxes away from labour. Potentially, here lies the single most important boost to employment today. Second, the rules governing labour markets need to be improved in line with our social models. The economies with more flexible labour markets were the ones that have weathered the crisis best in terms of employment. And third, we must overcome the growing divide on the labour market between insiders and outsiders, between those who are protected and those with the temporary unprotected jobs, mainly women, young people and unskilled labour uh, migrant workers. Also, rising inequality could threaten not only social cohesion and the stability of democratic institutions, but also put a break on growth and prosperity. The key element here is to look at education and jobs. All experts agree that inequality feeds on, on in inequate, inadequate skills and long-term unemployment, because they reduce opportunities and undermine social mobility. And that's why it is at the root that we must tackle inequality. Tax policy and social transfers have a role to play in correcting inequality exposed, but they are not enough. Tackling inequality at the root means better education and better skills. That does not necessarily mean more spending. It means better spending. Adapting our social market economy to the challenges of the 21st century Protecting our social models while making our European economy successful worldwide will require a strong involvement of social partners and a tough so social dialogue and a strong unity in purpose. And the purpose is making Europe a driving social market economy. This brings me to the so-called cyclical factors pushing up unemployment. In the European Council and in the Eurozone Summit tomorrow, we will discuss the economic situation. In recent weeks, economic data have confirmed that the economic recovery is weak and inflation remains low. Most member states suffer from high public and private sector debt. Supporting the recovery requires action both on the supply and on the demand side. 
And of course, we need to step up the structural reforms indispensable to raise productivity and growth potential. At the union's level, we have to develop further an energy union, a single digital market, and innovation via our EU budget. At the same time, we need to raise investment, physical investment. Investment fell strongly in the euro area at the start of the crisis and has not yet recovered to its long-term average. Member states suffering from an investment gap should consider addressing it without undermining their public finances. Structural funds have to be used to the full. And as a union, we should speed up projects with EU-wide relevance, notably in transport, energy and digital networks. The 300 billion euro of new private and public investment over three years, as proposed by the incoming Commission President, is a good proposal. This plan should be specified and be given top priority. Before concluding, let me add a word on climate and energy. The objective is to agree this evening the world's most ambitious yet cost-effective and fair climate and energy policy framework for the next decade. This should include a target to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent, increase the share of renewable energy, improve the energy efficiency and boost the energy interconnections. I'm hopeful that we will be able to reach this final deal tonight. It is a crucial deal for many reasons for the global climate, for the health of European citizens, for the leading role the EU plays internationally in climate talks, for sustainable jobs and European competitiveness, for European energy security as well. And I hope it will be the final deal that I broker as President of the European Council. And talking about my last European Council, this was also my last tripartite social summit. I would like to take the opportunity and thank all the social partners for the excellent cooperation during the last five years in this important forum. Thank you. Thank you. I pass now the floor to the President of the European Commission, Mr. José Manuel Barroso. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this uh, was a very important meeting with the social partners at European level before a European Council of particular importance. Uh, European Council, we are going to discuss uh, very uh, decisive issues from our policy on climate change and energy to Ebola, and of course about the economic situation too. Uh, on climate, uh, let me tell you that I'm confident that the heads of state and government will agree on the important target the Commission proposed for a 40 percent greenhouse gas reductions by 2030. For the reasons explained by President Van Rompuy, I will not uh, repeat them. I think it's crucially important that today there is this kind of agreement. Certainly, if we achieve this agreement, we'll be in a better position to lead the global discussions and to uh, encourage and others to follow the example of the European Union. Another issue uh, that is important today, and I'd like to take the opportunity to make an announcement, is precisely the fight against Ebola, uh, an issue that we should take very seriously. And uh, that's why I'm ha happy to announce that uh, uh, we have decided to make it public today that additional funding of uh, 24.4 million euros will be made available to speed up some of the most promising research to develop vaccines and treatments. Indeed, we are in a race against time on Ebola, and we must address both the emergency situation at the same time have a sustained medium long-term response. As you know, there are now talks today in the World Health Organization in Geneva, and this is a way also of the European Union to um, increase not only its commitment, but try to bring others to a more decisive response. But today's meeting was mainly about the economy, and so let me make comments basically on two issues, uh, the investment and the need for structural reforms. The meeting was about stimulating investment to create more jobs. Uh, as you know, the Commission has been striving for these objectives throughout my two terms in office. Target investment is the third pillar 
of the European economic recovery alongside fiscal consolidation and structural reforms. It is true that because of the uh, urgency of the financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, the attention was more focused on fiscal consolidation, but I want to make it clear, our response and our proposal has always been an holistic response, a comprehensive response that um, includes uh, structural reforms and investment, uh, apart from, of course, the other reforms we have been doing uh, in the uh, European Union, namely in the governance of the euro area. We've had to fight for more European investment at a time of crisis when debts were rising and budgets were under uh, heavy market pressure. But I believe we have succeeded in doing the most with what we had and what was possible to get uh, from the discussions with the Member States. We have focused the European Union budget where we can make the most impact. Since I took office in 2004, we have more than doubled research funding, tripled funding for education and training, and we have increased infrastructure spending more than sixfold. We have set aside an extra 6.4 billion euros for youth employment this year and next year, and this to help fund youth guarantees, a proposal the Commission made, and that was unanimously endorsed by the Member States, so that we can give young people options after leaving school or work. The social partners have been instrumental in getting this to the top of the European agenda, and I really want to thank them and urge them to do everything they can to help the implementation of the youth guarantees of the Youth Employment Initiative. More can be done in implementation. To support youth guarantees, we have made moves to increase the quality of traineeships, to boost apprenticeships, to tap the potential of digital economy and fill job vacancies across the European Union through the EURES Pan-European Jobs Portal. We have pushed for a capital increase for the European Investment Bank, boosting its lending capacity by 60 billion euros at a time when most European businesses are striving for more and better access to finance. We are working with the EIB to help leverage EU money, for example, through project bonds for new infrastructure links. As you know, member states, after some discussions, have accepted the project bonds pilot project bonds, now I think it will be important to have them in a sustained, permanent basis. A new COSME program, specifically dedicated to SMEs, was created for the first time, with a 2.3 billion euros budget over the next seven years, and a large share of Horizon 2020 will also support innovative SMEs. So, to put the record straight, Europe has been doing already a lot in terms of investment, but I think we can all agree that we can and should do more. I personally think now the conditions are better for that. That's why I very much welcome the proposals of my successor, my good friend Jean-Claude Juncker, and I hope that Member States will give those proposals a serious attention to see what we can do more together to support investment in Europe. Not only, of course, public investment, but private investment. And for private investment, one of the key issues is, of course, the commitment to reforms. If we really want to boost growth and jobs, if we are serious about reaching our 2020 targets, uh, member states need to get serious about reform. Uh, later today, I will be addressing the European Council on this issue, and this is what I will say. The efforts we have made over the last years are starting to pay off, but when it comes to reform, there are indeed different degrees of ambition in Europe. The ones who moved first are already reaping the rewards. Ireland, Spain, Portugal have left their assistance programs and are growing again. They have gone through extremely difficult circumstances, but in fact they have seen the efforts recognized. And there are other economic good news. The euro area is running a 9 billion euros trade surplus. Exports to the rest of the world have been growing. Budget deficits are down by half since their peak in 2009. We are much better than the United States or Japan, for instance. Boring costs for most of our member states are back to or below pre-crisis levels. These are good news, and these should ta be taken in consideration when we discuss about the current situation as well. Now, we are still concerned with the situation. Why? Because the recovery has been slower than expected, and it is indeed uneven. 
And, and, and above all, the concerns we have is, of course, unemployment is still too high. And this is, of course, also linked to the fragile growth. So to finally get past the crisis, we need to work on all fronts. Yes, we need investment, both public and private. But at the same time, we must preserve our hard-won market confidence by maintaining sound public finances and reforming our economies. Not only labor market reform, also the tax policies, the products, service markets, public administration, education, for example. This is critically important for our confidence to get back to Europe. If we follow this path, I'm positive we can build a better future for our citizens. So since this is my last meeting with European social partners, I would like to tell you all once again how much I have enjoyed our sometimes uh, lively discussions, that those discussions have given me insights into how to build a more competitive and inclusive uh, European Union based on the principles of responsibility and solidarity. I take this opportunity to thank very sincerely the social partners, the trade unions, the business organizations for their constructive contribution to European policies at a time when the European Union has been faced with critical challenges. Almost always, they have resisted the temptation to put the blame on the European Union, and they were very courageous defending among the associates how important the European Union is. And I really want to thank, because even the differences sometimes existing among social partners, I can testify we are very lucky to have at European level, from the business side, from the trade, labor, uh, um, uh, trade union side, very committed pro-Europeans. The Commission that was, uh, in fact, proud also to host for the first time the uh, social partners in a college meeting, showing symbolically how important we believe social dialogue is for Europe. The Commission, therefore, values our social dialogue highly. And I'm particularly glad to have been able to work with social partners over the last 10 years. And I thank you for your cooperation. I pass now the floor to Mr. Giuliano Polotti, the Minister of Labour of Italy, for his comments. Oggi abbiamo sviluppato un confronto a partire da un obiettivo, stimolare gli investimenti per creare lavoro, raggiungere gli obiettivi della strategia 2020. Questa scelta naturalmente guarda ad una situazione dell'Europa che è una situazione ancora difficile, fragile. L'economia vive ancora momenti di difficoltà, i rischi sono ancora alti, quindi abbiamo bisogno di lavorare a promuovere la crescita attraverso gli investimenti. Questo è il tema della discussione di oggi. E raggiungere questi obiettivi fissati dalla strategia Europa 2020 è un test della nostra credibilità. Abbiamo scelto degli obiettivi, dobbiamo avere la forza di valutarli e di discutere e pensare a come si può fare di più e meglio per raggiungerli. Finora questi risultati non li abbiamo raggiunti. La crisi We haven't ha yet prodotto attained those results. Uh, the un problema acuto su questo versante, in particolare sul tema dell'occupazione e sul tema dell'inclusione sociale. Adesso bisogna fare ogni sforzo per avvicinarci e cercare di raggiungerli. Per questo la Presidenza italiana ha promosso una discussione ad ampio raggio su questo tema della strategia Europa 2020 e l'ha fatto nelle diverse formazioni del Consiglio, intende presentare alla Different formations of the Council dicembre, and at the December General Affairs Council and at the European Council, we will be providing a summary of those discussions. The challenge is, of course, a very difficult one. We are talking about combating the negative effects of the crisis in terms of social rights, the impact on families, the employment rate in particular, and in particular in that respect, youth unemployment. Therefore, we need greater fairness, greater productivity. 
l'Europa e le sue imprese competono nel mercato globale e se non miglioreremo la nostra competitività non avremo più lavoro e se non avremo più lavoro non avremo risorse adeguate per buone politiche sociali. In questo contesto io vorrei sottolineare anche il significato del vertice di Milano dove abbiamo discusso del tema dell'occupazione dell'occupazione giovanile nello specifico e dove abbiamo sottolineato il tema del programma del progetto Garanzia Giovani. Eh, noi pensiamo che questo debba diventare strutturalmente e strategicamente un programma dell'Europa del futuro perché noi abbiamo bisogno anche di costruire sempre di più meccanismi, progetti e programmi che rendano chiaro ai cittadini italiani, ai cittadini europei, ai cittadini di ogni paese come le politiche dell'Europa parlano direttamente ai problemi di ognuno di loro e il tema della disoccupazione giovanile oggi è tema di grande rilevanza nella dimensione europea. Le pur necessarie riforme del mercato del lavoro, in particolare sul lato dell'offerta attraverso efficienti politiche attive da sole non saranno sufficienti a ridurre la disoccupazione a livelli accettabili. Quindi occorre agire anche sul lato della domanda aggregata. Per questo serve una combinazione di misure monetarie, fiscali, strutturali e sociali. Il rafforzamento delle regole sulla sorveglianza macroeconomica e di bilancio, il meccanismo per la stabilità finanziaria e l'unione bancaria sono elementi positivi. That we have the banking union are all positive elements, but now we need to have a more incisive response to the consequences of the crisis. We have to have proper coordination of our fiscal and financial policies with the growth policies, which are inclusive, and our social policies. We need to ensure that we have a common vision which favors quality investments from both the public and private spheres. We have to use public budgets and have a proper controlled level of risk. Therefore, it's very important that we continue to improve macroeconomic policy, saying not just that we have economic and financial budgetary stability, but also that we guarantee cohesion. We have to give a clear signal to our citizens that investments for social and economic inclusion in order to rebuild our economy human capital that is a priority in our European policies. We have to overcome the rigidity, the obstacles which our citizens feel in their economies that they don't tally with the needs that they see from the Europe that they want to support. I would in particular like to refer to the project that the President-elect, Mr Juncker, has come forward with the idea of new public investment over the coming three years, along with, of course, private investment with Ora, a total amount of up to 300 billion fare, euros. The question is not whether we should do this or whether we should do this. I rather we should be focusing on just how we want to act and how we want to implement this as quickly as possible. We cannot neglect in any way the need to make better use of the European Investment Bank in order to favour growth and jobs. One of our objectives requires also the crucial role of the European Central Bank in order to avoid the risk of deflation. Of course, we all have our own specific tasks, remits, but we know that acting together, pulling those efforts in the European dimension and at a national level as well is a sine qua non to guarantee the success of each and every individual party's action. Therefore, we have to fully respect our autonomous rights and remits, but at the same time share our objectives, share our strategy, because it is that that will enable us to provide an effective response to the needs of our community. It's a complex response. We can't do this just in one way with just one action, adeguato. we need to have Infine, an all-encompassing approach to this. Finally, I would like to stress that sarà il del the sociale, better the level of social dialogue that we have, the better the opportunities, opportunities will be that, that we can guarantee a satisfactory level of action. Sociali, Therefore, I would like to invite the social partners to be true protagonists, uh, lead together with the government uh, the work in meeting the Europe 2020 strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I now pass the floor to the President of Business Europe, Ms. Emma Marcegal. More or less, yes, Marcegal. <laughs> I know my surname is not very easy, even for the Italians, so thank you. Oh, thank you very much. It was, uh, uh, today was a very interesting discussion. Uh, the idea was to discuss about how to stimulate uh, 
private and public investments to create jobs. And as Business Europe, we give our idea. We said that normally for a company, for a European company, or for a company coming from abroad, uh, the investment that they can, uh, a company can consider to invest in Europe uh, because uh, uh, the company see a business-friendly environment, see a situation where the company can produ produce in a competitive way, and also if a company see that there is good internal demand and maybe also good external demand that can match with export if the company is competitive. So uh, we said that uh, we need uh, reforms to have a more competitive Europe. This must be done, first of all, at the national level. And here there are a lot of reforms that must uh, be uh, implemented at the national level. As Business Europe, we said that we strongly support uh, the Jobs Act that has been uh, 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 that is uh, under approval in, in Italy, but also other uh, uh, reforms that uh, are under uh, discussion in a lot of uh, national countries, such as education. Uh, we need, uh, as Mr. Varampoi said, the President Varampoi said, to have less uh, tax on, on labor cost. So there are a lot of reforms that we need at national level. And we have to say that uh, if we look at the country-specific recommendation, only 25% of this reform has been fulfilled. So this is not enough. So we need more reforms at the national level. But uh, we need also action at the European level to have a more competitive Europe. For example, we, saw, we said that uh, we still need to implement the single market. The single market has a strong potential for creating new jobs. We need uh, to tackle the legal fragmentation that is still there. Uh, there are still uh, remaining obstacles on cross-border business. And this, in our opinion, does not come from new legislation, but it comes from a, a better implementation of the existing rules. So first of all, at European level, we have to enhance uh, uh, the, the single market. Second. Uh, we need to work on access to finance. We agree also with uh, my colleague, uh, 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 President of uh, UAPMEP, that access to finance is still a problem in, in Europe, uh, uh, mainly for small media enterprises and mainly for the peripheral countries. There, we need really to implement the banking union in a very fast and good way. Uh, and also, uh, we need, for example, the AB to work and to support companies. And we need also to have a real financial market union with also alternative sources of finance to decrease dependencies on bank lending. Third point, we need also public investment. We think that most of the investment will come from private investment, but also we need public investment. We all know that the EU public investment is less than 5% of overall public expenditure, compared with 10% in the US. So there is place to, uh, to uh, uh, enhance and increase and optimize in public investment. At the European level, we, we think that we should invest mainly in broadband, energy, network interconnection in transport in digital and there is a lot of place to do this and this will also enhance the single market and enhance uh, competition and uh, more uh, and will make Europe a more competitive uh, place uh, we of course uh, strongly support uh, uh, the um, President Juncker plan of 300 billion euro. Of course, this uh, plan has to be fixed, has to be clear, has to um, be done. And uh, as Business Europe, of course, we will, uh, we will give our input and our proposal on, our, on how to do it in the, best, uh, in the best way. But there is also place to make new, more investment also at the national level, new public investment on the national level. We all agree this morning that there are countries, such as Germany, where there is place to do more public investment, and this should be done. And also in country with some financial constraints, there will be there be we a, 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 a situation in which there will be less expenditure in unproductive areas and more investment, public investment to enhance competitiveness. Um, then two last points. Uh, we think that uh, to have more investment, uh, we need also to open the markets. 
also on an international level. We are absolutely strongly supporting the conclusion of an ambition transit trade and investment partnership with the US. We know now the situation is not really going on as we, we would like, but uh, the TTIP is absolutely important. There are a lot of studies underlining that uh, a good conclusion of the TTIP could uh, raise and could uh, bring to a lot of uh, new jobs, uh, either both in the US and, of course, in Europe. Uh, we didn't like the fact that, for example, there is uh, a discussion going on not only with the TTIP but also with Canada on the fact that we should uh, drop the part uh, of uh, investor state dispute settlement. Uh, as we know, there are a lot uh, of these uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement also among uh, uh, country of the uh, European Union. Uh, we did this as European Union uh, with Korea, and there was no any discussion about that. Now that we are going to discuss with the uh, United States, uh, there are a lot of problems on this. So I, I see this more as an ideological point than a real one. And also, we didn't like the fact, as I said, that uh, with Canada, after five uh, years of negotiation, at the end, uh, uh, Germany asked for dropping uh, the ISDS. This is not good. This undermined the credibility of the EU. And uh, so we are uh, against that. Final point uh, is energy and climate. Uh, President Barroso and President Van Rompuy uh, spoke about this. Of course, as Business Europe, uh, we think that companies must do their part uh, on having uh, a, a, a less polluted uh, uh, Europe and uh, world. But we also have to put this together with the fact that we want to implement uh, the GDP coming from industry, and we want a strong industrial base in Europe, and we want to create new jobs. So our opinion, so we are asking for three points very clearly. First, that uh, we have to move away from three overlapping targets. On uh, we, we just want one target on re reduction on emission, not on energy efficiency and renewable. On the, the emission reduction target for 2030, uh, we ask that the proposed minus 40% minus target must be reassessed after the, uh, the meeting in Paris, because we also have to put in mind and to remind to us that uh, today Europe counts for around 11% uh, of the global emission. And in 2035, it will be 7 percent. If we go to minus 40 percent, but all the other countries all over the world doesn't, don't do anything, at the end, uh, we will have minus 2.8 percent of a global level with a very strong impact on our uh, competitiveness. So we have to go there with a strong target, but then be able to also reassess our target if nothing happens. Of course, we all have to work to have a, a strong and very good uh, agreement on a global level in Paris. And third point, uh, of course, we ask for having a, a, to have a fully-fledged reforms on the EU emission trading system post-2020, including an improved protection against carbon leakage. These are our main point, and of course, I, I did already this uh, during the meeting. I want also to do this now. I really thank very much uh, President Barroso and President Varampoy and also Commissioner Andor for the very important uh, role played and also for uh, uh, the willingness always to, uh, to listen to the social partners and also to, uh, to us as Business Europe. Thank you. The last speaker is the Secretary General of the European Trade Union Confederation, Bernadette Segol. The floor is yours. Merci. Uh... Le point de vue de la Confédération européenne des syndicats est que l'Union européenne est sur le bord d'une troisième récession et que nous risquons d'avoir de nouveau une augmentation du chômage. Dans le, le deuxième trimestre 2014, la croissance est moins importante qu'elle n'était l'année dernière. Nous savons que l'économie allemande est en train de se contracter, que l'économie française stagne et que l'Italie est en récession. Nous savons aussi que 12% de la, de la main dœuvre est sans emploi dans, dans la zone euro, 11% dans l'Union européenne, et que 
travailleur sur cinq euh, dans l'Union européenne a un travail à temps partiel. Un travail à temps partiel, ça veut dire aussi un revenu à temps partiel. Ça veut dire qu'il y a 3 millions de plus de travailleurs qu'en 2008 euh, qui euh, sont euh, à temps partiel. Ça veut dire que la demande pour euh, avoir des travailleurs s'est réduite plus que euh, les, les chiffres du chômage ne le, ne le montrent. Donc nous pensons que nous risquons euh, de la déflation euh, et que dans certains pays, par exemple la Grèce, l'Espagne et le Portugal, euh, c'est déjà le cas. Et que si cette tendance n'est pas renversée d'urgence, elle aura des conséquences tout à fait dramatiques pour l'économie de, de la zone euro et en particulier pour les pays qui sont très, très endettés. Quelques mots sur les réformes. Les euh, réformes du marché du travail qui réformes affaiblissent la sécurité de l'emploi et la sécurité des revenus ne sont clairement pas euh, la réponse. Pourquoi Parce que ça augmente euh, l'insécurité, euh, la précarité, ça fait que les individus ou les familles euh, économisent ne veulent pas dépenser et ça amène davantage l'économie européenne dans la récession et la, et la déflation. Si on veut avoir des, des réformes du marché du travail, ce n'est pas ce type de réformes-là qu'il faut faire et en tout, en tout état de cause, ces réformes-là euh, ne peuvent pas être... Euh, Top down, du haut en bas, mais doivent être négociés. Je dirais quelques mots sur le dialogue social. Nous pensons aussi que les réformes sont toujours, ou presque toujours, présentées comme étant des réformes nécessaires sur le marché du travail, sur la soi-disant rigidité du marché du travail. Rigidité dont nous ne sommes absolument pas convaincus. Il y a eu 3560 différentes réformes structurelles et réformes du marché du travail qui ont été faites depuis. 2008 avec des résultats qui sont euh, extrêmement euh, qui montrent que ça n'a pas été efficace sur euh, l'emploi. Nous pensons par contre qu'il faut euh, absolument augmenter euh, les réformes sur euh, qui amèneraient à stopper complètement l'évasion euh, l'évasion fiscale et euh, augmenter les réformes qui nous assureraient que nous sommes dans une zone euh, financière qui est stable. Or, euh, je pense que ces derniers jours, nous avons vu qu'il y avait euh, encore largement euh, des risques de, de ce côté-là. Nous pensons aussi que la déréglementation telle qu'elle est présentée dans le programme REFIT est une fausse euh, manière de euh, traiter euh, la question euh, de, de, de l'assouplissement des, des marchés, en particulier lorsque ces déréglementations euh, couvrent la protection dont jouissent euh, les, les travailleurs. Je pense en particulier à la euh, directive sur la protection de la maternité et je ne peux absolument pas croire que euh, mettre en cause cette protection de la maternité serait une aide euh, pour euh, euh, retrouver du, du travail. En tout cas, ce serait certainement interprété comme une initiative de, de l'Union européenne qui va à l'encontre euh, du bien-être euh, et de la protection des, des travailleurs qui est si importante pour que le projet euh, européen puisse continuer à être soutenu. Euh, le dialogue social. Nous en avons beaucoup parlé pendant cette, cette réunion et nous savons quelle est son, son importance pour que euh, ceux qui, les, les solutions qui peuvent être trouvées pour la sortie de crise soient euh, portées par euh, les gens et par les, par les partenaires. Mais nous savons aussi que le dialogue social, ce n'est pas euh, un, une, un rideau de fumée. Le dialogue social, ce n'est pas une rencontre entre d'une heure entre un gouvernement et, et des représentants syndicaux. Le dialogue social, c'est quelque chose qui se fait à long terme et sur lequel chacun peut se dire qu'il a une possibilité d'avoir euh, un impact. Et malheureusement, euh, dans beaucoup de cas, 
euh, dans beaucoup de pays, ce n'est pas euh, ce, que nous, ce que nous voyons. Euh, nous avons dit quelques mots également pendant cette rencontre sur euh, le, le TTIP, je ne sais plus le, le mot en français, mais les, les négociations avec les États-Unis euh, sur, le, sur le commerce. La Confédération européenne des syndicats n'est pas contre le commerce. Nous savons que nos... Euh, les travailleurs dépendent de la bonne santé commerciale des, des entreprises. Mais nous pensons que dans le cadre de négociations aussi importantes avec les, les États-Unis, il y a des conditions pour que un tel accord puisse profiter aux gens, pas euh, seulement à euh, une certaine partie de la population. Et nous avons trois conditions euh, sur, euh, cette, pour ce, euh, cet accord. D'une part, la suppression du mécanisme de euh, règlement des conflits, plus connu sous ISDS, qui donne un traitement privilégié aux investisseurs étrangers alors qu'il y a beaucoup d'autres solutions qui existent pour assurer les, les employeurs qui veulent investir. Deuxièmement, une liste positive qui nous rassure sur l'exclusion des services publics. Et troisièmement, l'intégration dans, ce, dans ces négociations des droits fondamentaux, y compris des droits sociaux fondamentaux tels qu'ils sont définis par l'Organisation internationale du travail. Nous avons été tous d'accord qu'il fallait des investissements pour restaurer la croissance. Ce n'est pas la première fois que je le dis euh, ici. La, la CES a un plan d'investissement qui est beaucoup plus ambitieux que euh, le plan qui est proposé par, euh, à l'heure actuelle par euh, Jean-Claude Juncker. Euh, son plan, c'est euh, 300 milliards euh, sur trois ans. Ça ne fait jamais que 100 milliards par an. Et je rappelle ici qu'on a dépensé 1000 milliards d'euros pour sauver les banques. On doit pouvoir dépenser plus que 300 milliards d'euros pour sauver, pour sauver l'emploi. Ce n'est pas assez, mais c'est un commencement. La question, c'est est-ce que nous allons voir de, de l'argent réel et est-ce que nous allons voir de l'action qui, euh, qui sera prise pour... Euh, que ces investissements puissent être palpables et euh, amener à de l'emploi. J'insiste, ce dont nous avons besoin à l'heure actuelle, c'est d'action. Des mots, nous en avons beaucoup. Et nous sommes euh, heureux d'entendre parler du dialogue social, d'entendre parler de, de la qualité du travail, euh, des investissements, mais nous avons besoin maintenant euh, que l'action suive. Euh, sur la question du climat, qui n'a pas, pas été la le premier point de discussion dans, dans, nos, euh, dans notre euh, discussion, mais qui, quand même, occupe une euh, partie importante. Nous pensons que la situation difficile de l'économie ne doit pas nous empêcher d'avoir des, des, des euh, ambitions euh, importantes sur la question euh, climatique. Cette semaine, des leaders européens se sont réunis et nous avons dit qu'il n'y avait pas effectivement d'emploi sur une planète morte. Et nous pensons qu'une action climatique forte pourrait bénéficier à l'économie européenne si l'Union européenne prend en compte l'idée que cette transition doit être une transition juste qui aide les travailleurs et aide les industries à... Euh, opérer le changement vers une économie euh, bas carbone. Nous soutenons les, euh, les objectifs obligatoires à établir à l'Union européenne, dans l'Union européenne, et ainsi que des objectifs euh, nationaux. Et euh, nous, nous espérons que l'Union européenne pourra adopter ces objectifs euh, ambitieux euh, dans, dans le cours du Conseil qui, qui va suivre. Enfin, euh, nous avons euh, géré remercier le commissaire Andor, le président Barroso et le président Van Rompuy. Nous avons souvent été en désaccord sur les politiques de gouvernance économique, mais nous avons toujours été reçus et sinon entendus, du moins écoutés. Et nous avons euh, en tout cas partagé l'idée que euh, l'objectif de l'Union européenne n'était pas un objectif du passé. 
mais bien un objectif du futur, même s'il si est de plus en plus difficile pour les travailleurs euro européens de le comprendre. Et c'est eux que je représente ici. Et c'est pour ça que nous demandons une nouvelle voie pour l'Europe. Merci. Merci. Giovanna Pancari, Sky Italy. Euh, J'ai une question pour le président Barroso. Dans votre discours, avant, vous soulignez l'importance de respecter euh, ce qui sont le, les paramètres européens par rapport euh, au, au budget, aussi pour garantir, avoir encore la confiance du marché. Alors, aujourd'hui, la Commission européenne il a envoyé une lettre à l'Italie euh, par rapport à sa loi de budget, euh, une lettre qui a été publiée par le ministère des Affaires économiques. Italien. Et je voulais vous demander des choses. Tout d'abord, selon certains euh, articles de la presse italienne aujourd'hui, euh, on dit que vous étiez un des premières à pousser parce que sa lettre ça sorte et parce que sa lettre soit assez dure par rapport à ce que l'Italie doit faire pour respecter ce que sont les paramètres de, euh, des budgets demandés par l'Union européenne. Donc, qu'est-ce que vous avez à dire sur ça Et aussi, dans la lettre, vous donnez 24 heures à l'Italie euh, pour donner des réponses, donc pour éviter un avis négatif. Qu'est-ce que vous vous attendez à ces points d'ici demain de la part du gouvernement italien. Merci. Et tout d'abord, je tiens à vous dire que la plupart des nouvelles qui sont parues dans la presse italienne concernant les positions que moi-même ou la Commission soutenons, la plupart sont des nouvelles absolument fausses, surréalistes, qui n'ont rien à voir avec la réalité. Et euh, si elles coïncident avec la réalité, je crois que c'est par hasard. Parce que systématiquement, des rumeurs, des sources non autorisées disent des choses qui sont, je, 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 je répète le nom, surréalistes. Complètement des inventions. Et franchement, je suis déçu de voir à quel point des, des organes de presse que je considère sérieux peuvent faire l'écho à ces rumeurs sans les confirmer d'ailleurs avec moi-même ou avec euh, la Commission. Ce n'est pas un exemple de rigueur, je dois vous dire. Ce n'est pas un exemple d'objectivité et de professionnalisme. Concernant, mais puisque vous me posez la question, je réponds en toute transparence, concernant la lettre que le vice-président Catalan a envoyée euh, hier <rire> à son collègue italien, c'est une décision unilatérale du gouvernement italien de la publier dans le site du La Commission n'était pas favorable à cette publication. Parce que nous sommes en train de poursuivre des consultations avec différents gouvernements. Euh, ce sont des consultations informelles. Dans un certain domaine, ce sont des consultations assez techniques. Et nous pensons que c'est mieux d'avoir euh, ce genre de consultations euh, dans une ambiance de confiance. Mais euh, le gouvernement italien a con con contacté euh, le vice-président Katainen en disant qu'il allait publier la lettre. Et bien sûr, nous ne nous opposons pas à la publication. C'est un droit. Mais, encore une fois, c'est absolument faux que ce soit la Commission qui a poussé à la publication de la lettre. Sinon, la Commission aurait pu publier les lettres elle-même. C'est ce que nous faisons normalement. Bon. Euh, en ce qui concerne la lettre du président, vice-président Katainen, elle a été faite parce que nous avons l'obligation légale d'après les règles que les États membres ont fixées, de communiquer au gouvernement lorsqu'il y a des doutes concernant la conformité de leur projet de budget avec les règles qui ont été approuvées, nous devons le faire dans ce délai. Le délai était précisément hier, c'est-à-dire pour donner encore le temps au gouvernement concerné de présenter des éclaircissements, des clarifications sur ces intentions. C'est ce que nous avons fait, le vice-président Katane d'ailleurs, en plein avec mon plein soutien et le plein so, soutien d'ailleurs du vice du président, euh, du nouveau président de la Commission, M. Jean-Claude Juncker. Donc je tiens à dire ça parce que je trouve que c'est extrêmement malhonnête et nuisible d'essayer de présenter des positions comme des positions personnelles. Lorsque nous sommes ici, la Commission européenne, dans un exercice extrêmement sérieux que les États membres nous ont confié d'analyse des budgets nationaux. 
C'est un exercice qui doit être fait avec du sérieux, avec du sens de la responsabilité et pas en termes comme, malheureusement, parfois, les gens veulent le faire en termes des batailles. La bataille de Bruxelles, j'ai vu écrit dans un certain journal, je crois pas italien. Je vous dis que si l'esprit est celui des batailles, alors nous serons tous perdants. L'important, c'est que les gouvernements européens et les institutions européennes travaillent en harmonie pour donner une réponse aux défis économiques que nous avons. Il faut une synthèse entre différents éléments. Il faut, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, le respect des principes de, de finances publiques équilibrées. Il faut des réformes structurelles plus avancées. Il faut de l'investissement pour la croissance. Si maintenant l'esprit est de mettre les uns contre les autres, alors je vous dis que, effectivement, euh, il y a un problème, il y a un problème parce que alors là, on ne va pas créer plus de confiance, on va créer moins de confiance. Et la variable confiance est essentielle dans l'équation pour la croissance. Euh, mais puisque vous avez posé une question même personnelle, je vous réponds personnellement sur ma position. Moi, je suis pour l'application des règles, bien sûr. La Commission est le gardien des traités. Le jour où la Commission européenne ne respecte plus les règles, alors il n'y aura plus de confiance en l'Union européenne. Alors là, il n'y aura plus de confiance en les traités. Nos, les... En Europe et en dehors de l'Europe, nous ne ferons plus confiance à ce que nous décidons collectivement. Donc je suis pour l'application des règles. En même temps, je l'ai dit et je le répète, je suis pour l'application des règles avec le maximum possible de flexibilité. C'est mon orientation Et c'est le temps dit que je serai présent à la Commission, ce que la Commission va suivre. Pourquoi Parce que je crois que nous sommes dans une situation économique très difficile, comme d'ailleurs on l'a vu, pas catastrophique. Là, nous étions il y a quelques temps dans une situation catastrophique. Nous ne sommes pas dans la même situation catastrophique où, par exemple, c'était difficile par certains de nos pays d'avoir recours au marché. Nous rappelons bien à quel point étaient les taux d'intérêt qui payaient l'Italie il y a quelques temps. Donc nous ne sommes plus là, mais nous sommes dans une situation très difficile proche, peu proche de la déflation. Donc je crois que la Commission doit interpréter de façon flexible les règles. Ça, c'est ma position. Pas du tout les, 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 les inventions que j'ai vues récemment dans la presse. On, on présente la Commission, le président de la Commission, avec une vision dogmatique qui n'est pas du tout la nôtre et surtout pas du tout la mienne. Donc j'espère que dans cet esprit d'appliquer les règles avec le maximum de flexibilité, on trouvera une solution qui sera bonne pour tous les États membres et pour la confiance dans l'économie européenne. Pour le président Barroso, pour follow up sur cette question, pouvez-vous uh, confirmer que la Commission a envoyé Another four letters to other four member states, uh, as uh, media reports uh, indicate. And uh, do you expect that uh, these five countries will change uh, course before Wednesday? And for the president of uh, Business Europe, I won't try to pronounce your surname, sorry. Um, um, while you said that uh, public uh, investments will increase, uh, in according to Juncker's uh, plan, the private sector should play the, the crucial role. So after your consultations with the members of your federation, are the, are the, the private sector ready to, to, investment, to invest and what will be the most uh, appropriate instruments to do that? Thank you. The question that you have addressed to me, I think I should not go more into it for the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, the vice president of the commission in charge has the responsibility the legal responsibility to be in dialogue with the different governments. It was our decision not to make this dialogue public at this stage. One government decided to publish the letter, others did not decide to do the, the same, at least so far. So we are not going now ourselves to, uh, enter, to enter in that public debate. I think it serves no purpose. Of course, when there was one government that decided unilaterally to publish uh, the letter that, we, that the Vice President of the Commission sent, of course, we have to explain uh, why that decision was taken. But I'm not going to comment on other situations. On, uh, on investment, uh, yes, our position is that um, 
the increase in investment that is absolutely needed in Europe, uh, as I said, must, must come both from public and from private, not only from public and not only from private. Uh, on private investment, uh, uh, yes, we think that uh, if uh, there are some reforms going on, the one I try to say on a national level and also a European level, there can be willingness, uh, willingness to invest from private sector. I think there are some instruments that can, we can apply or can, well, we can uh, implement. For example, uh, in a, there was a, a meeting in, in Milano uh, on uh, youth employment, uh, and there was also some representatives of EAB. EAB can be the one who can use funds uh, to support and, uh, 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 and uh, um, make the access to finance easier for uh, private uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, there is also project bonds can, that can be used. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there, will be, th there can also uh, be some uh, uh, private investments also from some uh, funds coming from the cash depot of the different national level. So I think there should be a mixture of different instruments, uh, um, a, mixture, a mixture of a different uh, uh, way of supporting the investment. So we are working on that. As I said, we will make our proposal and we will give our inputs on the different instruments that can be, can be used. Thank you for your attention. This is the end of the press conference.